in a remarkable uh, text on the architecture um, of the, the the sort of communes, the communes more generally of, of this era, uh, William Chaitkin invoked this connection, you know, this sort of projection, arguing, and I quote, that what was expected was found, vernacular revival, uh, simplified self-build, low-gain energy systems, all on the de-industrialized model of an underdeveloped country of communes. To him, the buildings on hippie communes represented a form of nostalgia, what he called vernacular nostalgia, one shared at that moment by many architects, implicitly recognizing that with modern housing, and I quote, demonstrable connections between the natural environment, the human habitat, and human culture had been lost. If as noted above, climate had, to some degree, informed these sort of hippie structures, if they used local materials, if they had emerged from with in a sort of self-identified cultural group, a group that, that very problematically called themselves a new tribe. These forms of habitations were not actually vernacular or regional in the strict sense of the term, even if they were certainly nostalgic. And so they were too idiosyncratic and, and, um, and sort of expressive. Yeah, they, were, they were not vernacular in the sense of having been handed down over generations. Climate, likewise, was not understood to inform the adaptation of these structures to their, uh, to their region, nor was it invoked under the auspice of a techno-scientific rationality in which calibration of things like heat or humidity, wind or rainfall would serve to functionalize control over the environment. The mild climate of Northern California had, or so they assumed, simply alleviated uh, these burdens, facilitating the removal of trappings of modernity uh, and encouraging a type of closeness to the earth. So from the perspective of architectural history, this produces a type of anomaly. So these shelters, again to stress, were not vernacular. They'd neither evolved over time from encountering cultural or climatic forces, nor had they been handed down, as I mentioned, over generations. They were also not, of course, high architecture in the institutionalized sense of a discipline and its role in Western culture. We could simply call them pseudo-vernacular, but there also seems to be an opportunity here to resituate them conceptually away from tropes of cultural authenticity, regional specificity, and naturalization, even if they claimed some of these terms, that tend to characterize both the discourse on architectural vernaculars and the communards' own claims and interrogate instead their modes of identification and appropriation. We might also see them as responding, albeit in a very different way, and, and these are images of what many people think of as architectural vernaculars in the 1960s, vernaculars that troped on ordinary suburban houses or on sort of commercial uh, dwellings. Uh, and I, I say this because to some degree they were responding to the same type of forces of advanced capitalism, but instead of embracing it uh, as architects like Robert Venturi or Charles Moore did, they were going in the other direction. So to be clear, you know, I don't want to suggest that these other low-tech, sort of idiosyncratic, uh, often quite bizarre structures were not the process, uh, the product of historical forces at work. I think they were exactly that. But to understand them, I want to push uh, their conceptualization in a different direction. Uh, and to do so, I want to come back to this term uh, that I take as the title, this figure of voluntary primitivism. It was a, ta a term uh, coined uh, by Ramon Sender uh, and central to this open land movement. As Richard Fairfield, uh, one of the key chroniclers of, 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 of the communes, explained, he said voluntary primitivism meant, and I quote, building your own biodegradable home out of mud and twigs and dead branches. It means giving up electricity, gas, running water and telephone, as well as other modern conveniences. Living on the land also means conditioning your body to withstand cold and damp, uh, carrying your own water for drinking, your own food for cooking. It means planting and harvesting your crops with muscle and not machinery, end quote. Sarah Davidson also included the fact that they ground their own wheat, made their own bread, canned their own vegetables, uh, etc. And so what we see here is... Yeah, their life becoming a sort of continuous cycle of manual labor. You know, again, uh, a, 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 a practice that for them we have to see as largely romantic. 
yeah? unlike the very unromantic conditions, of course, of people elsewhere. So in addition to developing these ritualized childbirthing practices, the communards attempted to abandon other aspects of modern medicine, refusing, again, what Michel Foucault would term the increasing medicalization of the body, or the way in which modern medicine and its uh, relation to capitalism kept people productive um, uh, for the sake of work. They were, for instance, uh, the communards experimenting with herbs and Indian healing remedies to try and become free of manufactured drugs. Going back to the land meant, in addition, a level of intimacy with the ground, even uh, at the expense of discomforts that architecture would traditionally defend the subject against. Houses shouldn't be designed to keep out the weather, they explained. We want to get in touch with it. That conditioning one's body to the land, often literally to the earth or ground, meant not only a level of physical uneasiness, but also of exposure to disease, was evident uh, to one journalist, who in recounting the problems arising at Wheeler's, very symptomatically alluded to the United States' less developed neighbor. And she says, because of the haphazard sanitation system, the water at Wheeler's is contaminated, and until Mex uh, uh, like Mexico, and until they adjust to it, they suffer dysentery just as tourists do who drink the water in Mexico. There are periodic waves, uh, uh, basically of various disease. You know, so again, um, uh, it's not just they're, they're uh, identifying, um, uh, uh, yeah, with. With, with, with poverty, they're also uh, immediately to see. And this is what was causing the state uh, such a high level of anxiety. So Wheeler, though, and, and the other sort of leaders of this group would remain adamant about maintaining this relation to the earth. Uh, and even when they were forced to include uh, sanitary technology like toilets, they would refuse to use it. And they would refuse to use it um, on purely ideological grounds. So what then, I want to ask, you know, what sort of ethics of care, of self, and of the land was really at work here? How are we to understand this type of risk? One partial answer to the question involves the widespread and often phantasmatic attribution of healing powers to the land, the idea that the land would heal both itself and the humans who live in close proximity to it, yeah, basically refusing to take any sort of responsibility. Beyond the problematic mysticism, then this ideology quickly translates, as I said, into uh, sort of ceding responsibility to nature or of not taking responsibility for the environment. A less problematic counterpart was the argument that modern society caused its own types of illnesses, physical, social, and psychological. Refusing concerns of the sanitary regulations as ideological, Gottlieb remarked, they speak of health, but they know they are not the curers of disease, they're the producers of disease. And so their manifesto was even more explicit about this, suggesting that these practices offered a line of flight, a type of escape from these sorts, uh, even a sort of therapeutic alternative to the normative disciplinary institutions of contemporary society. And I quote, they say, the more complex a society becomes, the more important it becomes to allow people to return to ancestral ways whenever the stresses and strains of modern living begin to drive them sick or crazy. In the enlightened world of the 1970s, as leisure becomes compulsory, the voluntary return to the soil will replace the gale, uh, sorry, the ghetto jail nuthouse syndrome, uh, conditioning uh, conditioned by their fast competitive culture to unnatural living conditions, <laughs> Americans find themselves falling sick and dying prematurely in a diseased society. So faced uh, shortly after this with the, again, the closing of the commune, Lou Gottlieb even appealed to the courts to accept their strange ways by arguing that open land would save the state money, replacing the, ne uh, the need for jails and other forms of institutionalization, then proliferating to deal with these types of what they call dis-ease. Reiterating the imminent obsolescence of the country's youth, he also prophesied that it might serve as a means to stem violence, to stop violence. He goes on, the day may arrive when transferring ownership of small remote portions of public land to God will provide, appro provide appropriate tribal sanctuary for some of the desperate, technologically unemployable inner city habitants. He called this a constructive alternative to incendiary rioting. 
So as mentioned above, this is one of the images of the, the commune. As mentioned above, one central premise of open land was that the land would select its inhabitants, hence forming what they believed to be a tribe, and teach them how to become its stewards, its caretakers. Population would effectively be self-organizing, albeit mediated through the land. People would leave when conditions deteriorated enough, and those remaining would learn to live with each other. Shared ancestry, shared customs, Pardon? That's pretty crazy, yeah? I mean, they're like pretty nutty, yeah? <laughs> um, uh, shared ancestry, customs, uh, care of the land, like was characteristic of Native American tribes with whom hippies so often identified were to be replaced somehow by the spontaneous emergence of shared ideals. In the meantime, under the pressure of the massive influx of people and with the accumulation of waste by less conscientious residents and visitors, as well as the destruction of trees, the leveling of ground for campsites, and problems of multiple campfires in a fire-prone region, the land and its habitants experienced a significant level of environmental distress. As architect and co-founder of Ecology Action, Chuck Herrick, who worked on this commune, explained, he said, with the great number of people on the land, the two inadequate toilets were literally inundated by a river of shit, with unburied fecal matter accumulating on the property, contributing to serious health hazards. Morningstar had become a microcosm of accelerated environmental crisis, a testing ground not only for creating apparently new selves, but they imagined for fueling the fear, or that they didn't imagine, that for fueling the fear that Earth was facing the threat of a global uh, population explosion that Paul Ehrlich's best-selling The Population Bomb. Uh, um, uh, so basically I'm trying to point to the fact that in their lack of care for the land and the, uh, the destruction of the environment, um, even though they saw this as um, part of their ethos, in fact it, it also served to make people um, afraid the, uh, basically, it sort of fueled a, a fear of population growth in developing countries, you know, that it played into this ideology of population growth uh, in a very problematic way. So as mentioned above, Native Americans played a large role in this hippie imaginary. On the one hand, they represented an alternative social relation, uh, this sort of tribalism, as well as closeness to nature and a non-proprietary relation to the land. You know, they didn't individually own land. It's like the Indians, land held in trust for all to enjoy, Gottlieb explained. When in September of 71, he prepared a, a legal brief about deeding Morningstar to God, he noted, among other points, that such an act recreates in the consciousness of white people the attitude towards nature of the indigenous people of this hemisphere. You know, so again, like highly ideological and sort of mythological uh, in, in this um, in this realm. And the teepee served, and the teepee is you know, this Native American tent, and the teepee served as a privileged icon for alternative modes of life. On the one hand, beyond the sort of form of mimicry, Native Americans were occasionally invoked as fellow underclasses of American society with whom they claimed affinity as victims. Morningstar took on more and more the aspect they explained of a besieged Native village, uh, and this is, this is uh, uh, from one of their reports. There's little doubt that this identification with Native Americans was intended to be sympathetic. But these identifications with otherness, which typically involved a problematic naturalization, if not simply mythical projections, did not typically open a space of political encounter. Contemporary social justice issues and right struggles concerning, for instance, land, financial and technological resources, medical care or housing received absolutely no visibility. It was further uh, uh, not only Native Americans with whom these communards identified or from whom they borrowed built forms and other cultural trappings. As we've seen, one also repeatedly finds enlisted, often interchangeably and certainly um, contradictorily, tropes pertaining to developing countries, to barrios, to shanty towns, to America in the 19th century or America following a nuclear apocalypse or ecological catastrophe. So what, what one journalist called uh, an imminent sense of, of doomsday was widespread among, uh, among this group. And the communards repeatedly noted that they were adopting these primitive habits as part of a game plan of training for survival, developing knowledge appropriate, or so it was assumed, for life after the end of modern technology. 
We are running a pilot study in survival, they explained to one journalist. But these identifications and concerns don't account for the uncanny return of cultural trappings from clothing to tools to shelter from 19th century American pioneers, that hippie tribalism was often, uh, often appeared in conjunction with this frontier mentality, reminds us that this type of nostalgia can be highly problematic, in this case hauntingly recalling the 19th century migration west and the violent struggles with Aboriginal peoples over access to and privatization of the land. The hippies, as Hedgepeth remarked, all too ominously, had begun a new colonization of the continent, one ambiguously identifying at once with the colonizers and the colonized. Moreover, in their search for cheap land, the commune movement expanded throughout the southwest, and the threat of the second wave of settlement was not lost on the native population or on earlier Spanish-speaking settlers, whose unromantic contemporary living conditions and political and economic status were unlikely to benefit. So Marx, Karl Marx, might serve to remind us here that this was not the first time that such a symptomatic revival occurred in the course of revolutionary social projects. And these, these, these communists believed that they were revolutionary, just to, to be clear. As noted in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, tradition from all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living particularly in epochs of revolutionary crisis, where they nervously summon up the spirits of the past, borrowing from them their names, marching orders, uniforms, in order to enact new scenes of world history. So what then, to come back to my question, was it about the 19th century that so appeared to capture the imagination of the hippies, even if subconsciously weighing like a lingering nightmare? Mm -hmm. 